As you're standing, turn with me to 2 Kings 6, 1 through 7. I'm going to continue talking about prayer and fasting or 911, recovering the axe head. 2 Kings 6, 1 through 7, and the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See now the place where we dwell is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a beam from there. And let us make a place where we may dwell. So he answered, Go. Then one said, please consent to go with your servants. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down a tree. The iron axe head fell into the water. And he cried, alas, master, for it was borrowed. So the man said to God, the man of God said, where did it fall? And he showed him the place. So he cut off a stick and he threw it in there and he made it float. Therefore, he said, pick it up yourself. So he reached out his hand and he took it. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The story is told that in a small Kentucky town, there were two churches. And there was one whiskey distillery which was owned by the town atheist. Church members complained that the distillery gave the community a bad image. And so they unsuccessfully tried to shut it down. One Saturday night, the two churches got together and they held a joint prayer meeting during which a terrible storm raged for hours. Lightning struck the distillery and it burned to the ground. The next Monday, both pastors stood in their pulpit and they preached on the power of prayer. The insurance company decided not to pay for the damages due to the act of, the act of God clause in the policy. So the distillery owner sued both churches for conspiring with God to destroy his building. In court, both churches denied any involvement in causing the fire. A confused judge said, I find one thing about this case very complexing. The plaintiff, an atheist, is professing belief in the power of prayer, and the defendants, church members, are denying that same power of prayer. I've come to tell you this morning, make no mistake about it. There is not just power in prayer. There is wonder-working power when we pray. For when we pray, we, we, when we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. And God has called this church specifically into 40 days of prayer and fasting. And while we don't have to fast when we pray, we're doing it because this Bible, the holy book of God called the Bible, Jesus said in Matthew 17 and 1, be very, very sure that there are some problems in your life. There are some issues that will come into your life. There are some demonic forces for sure that will mount their attack against your life that for sure they will not move if you do not add fasting to your praying. And I want to say this morning that we do not make excuses for not fasting. And we don't fast because we have to. We fast because we need to. Because we have found out that the prayer and fasting has the power to break some things over in our lives. It has the ability to bring things into our lives that will never be possible and that will never take possession of, but that we overcome with prayer and fasting. And I want to say this morning that if there is something that the church needs to possess, we need to take repossession of the anointing. That that we once knew and that we once have, but we have allowed the devil to hijack it from us. I want to say something, and please listen to the Holy Spirit. We lack the power that we once knew in the kingdom of God. What was once under our feet is now over our heads. Even the half-baked Christian would say to us today that something radical needs to and must happen in this nation. Mario Murillo said this, our tragedy is classic. The world believes a lie because Hollywood and news media have stepped way beyond their rightful place. Listen now, they have an agenda and they have the resources to carry out that agenda. With their talent, they fake the foolish, the vile, and the empty and make it awesomely appealing while we take unspeakable glory and manifold cure and we bungle our presentation as if we were lying. The world lies well, and the tr church tells the truth poorly. But let me tell you what I believe. I am convinced this day that with all of our fumbling, with all of this that we have messed up, I am convinced that God is about to pour out a spirit 
that in only a moment's notice in the spirit realm that will knock the footing and the moorings out from over the devil's feet. And I am convinced if I'm by myself that once again miracle working power of God will once again be upon his church. Wonder working power will flow from the lives of his children and the world will know how great is our God. But listen, if you're just fasting and you are not praying, you're just on a diet. Because we're chasing after something here. And it's not one or the other. you got to fast and pray. And I remind you that the Holy Spirit said that if we will do so, God said in Isaiah 65 and 24, it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are speaking, I will hear. But church, listen. We are fasting, and what we're fasting for runs deeper than that. We are fasting, as I told you last Sunday, that we might recover the axe head. And again, I hope all week long you were asking the question, but Bishop, what does the axe head have to do with prayer and fasting and the power of God? Touch somebody and say, he's so glad you asked. Now watch. Elijah is with his mentoring group. They are the school of the prophets. As in the ministry of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his disciples that followed, the purpose of the ministry and the miracles as they are today of both Elijah and Elisha was to authenticate the messenger as the one who was carrying the message of God. And through those miracles, they were to demonstrate the love that God has for his people. But get this in your spirit. The primary purpose was to demonstrate that there is a futility of chasing after anything that takes us away from the power and the name of Jesus. And that accent is symbolic of not only the power of God, but it is the reality that in the ministry and how we can lose the anointing of God. Let me walk you through this axe head thing. Because it is, it is this very thing concerning the axe head as to why the church of Jesus Christ lacks power. Let me say something that is very irritating. Pentecostal charismatic movement is now virtually a caricature of our message. We have shout, but no clout. We write songs and we talk about everything has the bow to the name of Jesus, but when we say his name, nothing bows. We write songs of victory over evil that are more suitable for the playground rather than the battleground. Our songs of victory and praise have turned into songs of misery. We sing songs of woe instead of songs over the victory of our foe. We sing songs that make us feel good rather than exalting the name of God. We have become internalized in our praise and our worship as well as preaching. It's about how good can God make me feel. And our theology has become warped. There's a song that we sing. You've heard it. It's called Surrounded. In that song, it talks about the communion table of God. And I heard where Jessica gave me a copy of it and another church was singing it. And they changed the words about the blood shed for me and his body to your instructions for me at the table. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And we wonder where the anointing has gone. We have taken away and we have changed our theology to make ourselves feel good. Stay with me. That axe head falling into the water was symbolic of what can happen when the church loses the anointing. Let me make some observations about that axe head. Observation number one. The axe head was borrowed. Listen to me, church. The church of Jesus Christ, we have lost our power because we have forgotten that any power, any anointing, any gifting, it is not mine. It is not, I don't own it. It belongs to God. It has been loaned to us. We have forgotten that we are the owners of nothing and we are the stewards of everything. And that includes the anointing. That includes our gifting. You see, there are preachers, we think that our gifting belongs to us. Worship singers think that their gifting belongs to them. 
Musicians think that their gifting belongs to them. Teachers and prophets and ministers of the gospel, we believe that our gifting belongs to us. I want to say something, church, that is very important. Everything that we have, everything that you have, everything that you, uh, you own, the clothes on your body, the house you live in, the car you drive, you do not own it. It belongs to God. You are the steward thereof. And if we're not careful... We pastors see a little bit of growth in our church and we begin to believe that it's because of our preaching or our teaching or our administrative skills. And I fear that many in church circles, from the platform to the pew, we have forgotten the words of Exodus 23 through 5. You shall not have any other gods before me, for I, the Lord your God, am jealous, a jealous God. I was watching Oprah Winfrey and a preacher quoted that scripture. And let me tell you about Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey grew up in a Christian home. She was a Baptist girl, but she has now drifted away, and she has this antichrist belief that there are many ways to God. Let me tell you why she said she drifted away from God. She said, I don't think that I can serve a God who is jealous of me. I thought about that, and I said, so in essence, what you're saying is you can't serve a God who is jealous of all this material wealth that you think that you got by your own power, not understanding that it is he who gives you the power to get wealth and not yourself. You see, today in many churches, we have forgotten that any gift and any measure of success that we have, it is not ours. It comes from God. It is borrowed. Tell somebody your life belongs to God. The second observation I want to make is this about that axe head. That axe head was lost. Don't miss this. We have lost our edge, our anointing. That axe head falling in the water, being lost, was symbolic of losing the anointing. And here's the dangerous thing. Church, look at me. It is very possible for you and I to run on for a long time and look like we're being productive without the anointing. But believe me when I tell you this, eventually every last person comes to the end of yourself, to the end of your own might and your own power. And the church of Jesus Christ in America as a whole, we are running dangerously low on the supply of the anointing. Philippians 1.19, the Apostle Paul said, For I know that this shall turn out to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Church, listen. There is a supply of the anointing of God that is running dangerously low in the modern church of Jesus Christ. We have sunk so low that now we fake when there are miracles. Rather than seeking the God who still performs miracles in this day and age. I was watching a preacher on TV and I began to see something that really blew my mind. The camera went where they didn't want it to go, and the camera landed on his wife. And before they would send someone up to be prayed for, she had a little microphone, and he had a piece in his ear, and she would ask them what their sickness was, and they would roll up, and then he would stand there and tell them what their sickness was as though he had a word of knowledge. Listen to me, church. Galatians says this. Six and one. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou be also be tempted. Now that scripture is often used when talking about people falling into sin. But let me tell you what fault really means. It means to deviate from the prescribed order. And if God would ever help us understand anything, please let us understand that we have drifted so far away from God's prescribed order that the world looks churchy and the church looks worldly and I don't know about you but I am so tired of the church lowering the bar so low that even a snake can crawl under it. Observation number three. There was a concern over the lost axe head. And I know I'm not the only one, but sometimes I feel like I'm the only one that it seems to care that there be a definitive line of demarcation between how Christians live and non-Christians live. I have a concern. There is a spiritual case, sarah, sarah, whatever will be mentality that seems to have invaded the hearts of Christians. I want to tell you something. I am weary of a church that keeps trying to accomplish the work of God with stains on their hands of sin. 
God does not anoint filthy hands. God anoints pure, clean, holy hands. 1 Timothy 2 and 8, the Apostle Paul said, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. I was crying out to God and I said, God, we've got preachers laying hands on people on Sunday morning after their hands have been where they should not have been on Saturday night. And church, if we are going to get an outpouring of the Spirit of God, we can't continue to lift up hands stained by sin to a holy God. I want to say it again. God is looking for something or someone to silence these false prophets of the profane and the church of Jesus Christ. We need something upon us that will shut the gainsayers down today and it will not happen with the debaters, the loud preachers, the superior training programs, nor with louder, louder and larger sound systems. We need to hear the Holy Spirit. We cannot change the world as long as we are like the world. And God cannot use us to change the world until he can change us. Amen. Jensen Franklin, he tells the story that shows us the problem with too many Christians. There was this woman who moved back to Georgia to purchase the homestead on which she grew up. Her mother and her father had passed away and the land had to be claimed. One of the first things that she had to do was hire someone to clean out the well that her father had dug many years ago. You see, over the years, a lot of stuff had accumulated in that well and made the water worthless. The crew got a good-sized pile out, and they showed the woman so that they could get paid for the job, and she looked at them, and she says, Nope, there's something more in there. Keep digging. This went on for about three days, and finally at the end of the third day, the woman looked at the latest pile of trash, toys, and miscellaneous objects that had been found in the bottom of that well, and she says, now you're done. Puzzled, one of the men asked her how she knew that it was time that they were done, and she answered, because when I was a little girl and Papa dug that well, I took a teapot and I threw it in the well, and I figured the first thing that went into that well would be the last thing that came out. I said that to say this, during this fast, we all need to let God, let the Holy Spirit come in. And just like those well diggers, we need to let him dig up the stuff that needs to come out of our spirits, that hinders the anointing of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need to tell the Holy Ghost, dig until you've gotten that teapot out of my heart. Listen to me, church. Fasting will cause you to get the spiritual crud out of your life, cleaning the inside, which will make the outside clean. Church, Church, hear this. Holiness is an inside job. When God is allowed to change us, we will once again be anointed to change the world. I'm talking about an anointing that when it goes into us, it so flows out of us that when we enter a room, us walking into the room literally changes the temperature of the atmosphere in that room. That's the anointing that God wants to give us. Jessica was a little girl about four years three to four years old, Shauna was a baby. We went to visit my parents, and Lady Brenda and Shauna stayed at the house. I took Jessica with me to a basketball game. And we walk into my high school where I hadn't been in years, and I sat down with my daughter in the bleachers, and immediately a young girl turns to me, and she says, you're a preacher, aren't you? And I said, yes, how did you know? She said, when you walked up and you sat down, the whole atmosphere changed, and it didn't feel normal anymore. When God brought that story back to me, I said, God, that's the kind of anointing that is not just there for we who stand in the pulpit. It is there for you that sit in the pew. Let me illustrate it another way. A man went to a dentist in Boston. When the dentist got inside of his mouth, He's looking at the front of his teeth, and they're beautiful, and they're polished, and they're white, and he looks at them. But once he got in there, he looked behind, and most of his teeth were rotted because, you see, he had been brushing the front of his teeth but not brushing the back. And he told the dentist, he said, you have to brush the back of your teeth too? Listen to me, very church. Listen to me, church. Most of the churches in America, we look polished on the outside. We got the best sound systems. 
We've got the nicest sanctuaries. We've got such cushy, padded pews that now we've become cushy, padded Christians. We, listen, we put on worship performances in most of our churches, but we do not lead people in worship. Lady Brenda and I know of one church, the worship team, the, all of the people, the media, the musicians, they have to be at church at 5 in the morning for a 9 o'clock service because they have to go through what they call the performance of worship. And we wonder where the anointing of God has gone. I want you to go back with me for a moment. I want you to think about when you first came to Jesus. You wanted him in his presence more than anything, but then Mark 4, 19 happened. The seed of the word was sown in your life, and when you heard it, you received it right with great joy. You were on fire for God, and you said there is nothing and there is no one who is going to steal this word or the joy of God from my life, and God was a and would forever be number one. Then number verse number 19 happens. But then the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires of other things entered in, choking the desire of God's presence out of your heart. Now you come to church still, but the word goes in, but it's unfruitful in your life. Listen to the Holy Ghost. We have a distracted church in America. We have been so mesmerized by all that the world has to offer. So much that we have become so comfortable with merely punching in our time clock on Sunday morning. Listen to me. God, I'm crying. God, I'm crying. Make us once again come to church with great expectation. Oh God, how do I know that the church lacks expectation? Because half of the church comes to church when half church is over. The other half that is on time. It takes half of the praise and worship service to get them mentally engaged. Forget about spiritual engagement. We could get to church on time on Sunday if we didn't spend so much time on Saturday night doing everything but getting prepared. The reason some of us can't get to church on time on Sunday morning is because on Saturday night we're in the nightclub not understanding that it's called a nightclub because they do things at night in that club that you shouldn't be doing instead of getting on our bed. Uh, bed so we can get up in the morning and get on our face and get anointed. We come into the house of God and we want to get anointed for the worship. Listen to me. You're supposed to come in anointed to worship. You're supposed to come in prepared to give God the glory and the honor and the praise. Listen church. We have become like the world. We're chasing everything and everybody but God. American Idol is no joke. We will chase men, our favorite secular artists, and even our favorite worship artists. But we won't chase after God. We'll sing chasing after you, but we don't do it. Again, we've got preachers telling people, fast and pray so you can get a bigger house and a nicer car. I am telling you at Eagle Heights Cathedral, no. No. You fast and pray. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. Somebody say, all these things shall be added unto you. Listen now. If we're going to have the anointing of God once again that brings revival, we got to go back to the place where we first believed. That axe head was found where it was lost. <laughs> I want to say that again. That axe head was found where it was lost. It wasn't somewhere out there. The anointing is not out there. The anointing is where we left it. Oh, God will recover the accent, the anointing, if we will go back to where we first lost it. Where did we lose it? We lost it when we used to bow at the altar and we would stay until God was done. We lost it when we used to fast and pray and seek the face of God until there was a breakthrough. And listen to me very closely. Do not let material things fool you into believing that they are a sign of God's favor on your life. He says, I reign on the just and the unjust. Observation number five. The axe head must be personally received. Elisha asked his mentee, 
Where did it fall? And the mentee showed him, and Elijah threw that anointed stick over in the water, and the axe head came floating up. But watch this now. Once the axe head came up, Elijah says, now take it up for yourself. In other words, I have positioned you to recover what has been lost, but if you want what was lost, you're going to have to go in there and get it for yourself. God is saying to all of you under the sound of my voice, I am positioning you to recover the anointing, to recover the axe head. I am giving you this word. I am calling you to fast and pray. But if you want this thing, you're going to have to go in there and get it for yourself. Translation, how bad do you want it? Now watch. Nobody can get anointed for you. And you can't operate in somebody else's anointing. This thing that God is getting ready to do, you can't have it unless you go after it. And read my lips. It is not coming to you. And you can't siphon it off somebody else. This anointing that is coming to God's kingdom in the last day is a whosoever will anointing. Some of you, listen to me. Your wife's going to get anointed and she's going to leave you in the dust if you don't wake up, man. Ah, uh, and vice versa. Some of you women better wake up. You've been praying for God to anoint your husband, and he's going to get anointed, and then you're going to get mad because you could have run with him. Matthew 5 and 6, blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Someone in my former ministry walked up to me one Sunday and said, I wish I could hang around you and your anointing all day. I said, my God, man, why would you want to do that? When God's got a special anointing that he wants to put on your life. Listen to me, church. You need to get to the place where you're able to lay hands on the sick and they recover. You need to get to the place where you're able to speak to devils and they retreat. You need to get to the place where you cast down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Instead of every time you get a hangnail calling for a preacher. Oh, preacher, will you come pray for my boo-boo? I'm trying to help somebody. I know there's a time to call for the elders of the church. But listen to 1 John 2 and 20. But you, everybody say you. you. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. You, 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 you. You have an anointing. And it's about time that some of you started pursuing God so he can unlock the anointing that is resident on the inside of you. So that you can show forth his might and his power. In your family, in your workplace. You know what God said to me? He said, I'm getting ready to release such an anointing that it's going to get on the youth and the children. And they're going to start using their opportunity in sports, in whatever they're in, especially in school. And they're going to be using that as an opportunity to seize it when it rises to show forth the power and the might of God. I will never forget when I was in college and there was this, we were playing in a basketball game and this one kid, we were playing the Baptist college. Now understand this. It was one of those Baptist colleges we don't speak in tongues and those that do are of the devil. Now they're playing the Pentecostals. That boy went through and he went in to shoot a layup and one of the boys on our team gave him an elbow that knocked him into a new century. That boy hit the floor. He was laying there. I mean, he was out like a light. And somebody said, go call 911. So while somebody ran to call 911, I called on Jesus. I laid my hands on him. I started speaking in tongues, and the Holy Ghost hit that boy. And he sat up and said, he touched me. <laughs> Listen to me, church. I am telling you right now that there is an anointing coming back to the Bible, to the, the church of Jesus Christ, so we can quit calling 911 and we can walk in an anointing that when we need it, it will rise up on the inside of us because I'm telling you it is in you, but you got to stir the thing up. Observation number six. God used another person to help the other find the ax head. Here's what I mean. When Lady Brenda and I were in Seattle, I had been on two back-to-back 21-day -back fasts. 
And I said, God, ain't nothing happening. And God said to me, here's why. And in fact, Pastor Lopez had engaged me every Tuesday. He was fasting and praying with me. And God said, here's why. Because you are not meant to carry the weight of what I'm going to do all by yourself. He said, what I want to do in this house is release a corporate anointing. Therefore, it must be a corporate venture, a corporate fast. Leviticus 22, 7 through 8. You will cause your enemies and they shall, you will chase your enemies and they shall fall by the sword before you. Five of you shall chase a hundred and a hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight and your enemies shall fall by the sword before you. As I was praying, the Lord brought my mind back to something that I shared with you years ago that I believe is why God has called us to 40 days of prayer and fasting rather than 10 or 21. In his book called The Prophetic Whisper, Richard Gazowski talks about something very powerful. Please dial in here now. He and his wife were in a season of fasting and praying on a beach in California. His wife looked a, walked a little farther down the beach ahead of him and began praying for a woman whom they knew was being tempted into adultery. The moment she spoke that woman's name out loud, a swarm of flies ascended from the ocean's surface as if orchestrated by an invisible conductor, and they swept like a blanket across the water and onto the beach. He rushed over to see if his wife was okay when she told him that she had been praying for the friend. The Lord revealed what Gazowski referred to as a vulnerability in Satan's kingdom. Listen now. That being Lord of the Flies. Matthew 12, 24 says, Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not, talking about Jesus, does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, which means Lord of the Flies. It is interesting that during the prayer for someone being tempted by demons, that a horde of flies came out of nowhere and descended on this woman. This weakness that Gazowski refers to relates to the lifespan of flies. Watch now. You can study just about any of the species and you will find that their reproductive cycles range from a day to as many as 40 days. That is why in order to exterminate an infestation of flies from a crop, you have got to spray pesticides for 40 consecutive days in order to utterly destroy them. If you stop short of the 40 days, you will destroy only the existing generation, but the next generation will live on. Just as spraying pesticides for a full 40 days wipes out an infestation of flies, when we enter into a season of 40 days of fasting and prayer, I believe this, we can break not only free from the bondages in our own lives, but I believe that in this season of fasting, God is going to annihilate, obliterate forces of darkness as we pray and we seek his face. And let me tell you what I believe. He's going to do it in more than one situation in situations that we could not have imagined. And God said to me, I'm going to break some strongholds and I'm going to break them not only in the lives of this generation, but in the next generation because of your obedience to fast and pray in this generation. How would you like for your grandchildren and your children not to go through what you've had to go through? I have not had to go through things my parents and my grandparents went through because somebody stood in the gap for a generation. Gazowski was so right. Listen to me, church. You're scared of a short-term skirmisher. Jesus was not beaten and crucified, buried in that borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, and God raising him on the third day just so he might give the devil a bad day. 1 John 3 and 8 says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might utterly destroy the works of the devil. The Greek understanding of a, that word destroy means to obliterate, annihilate, render powerless the works of Satan as though they never existed. But listen up. God manifests his power only through sold-out sanctified vessels of honor. 
Ron Dunn said this, the world does not fear the church, it barely tolerates the church. It considers the church no longer a player in the world of affairs and only an observer. The church is a quaint old relic of the past that lends a certain charm to a neighborhood, a holdover from bygone years, big, harmless, like a beached whale. When I heard that, though it were true, I was insulted. Something rose up on the inside of me. And I said, God, that may be the picture of the church right now. But I am here to announce that it is going to be no more. Listen to me, church. God did not call the church to be sparring partners for the devil to bang around at his pleasure as if spiritual defeat was our job. God has called us to be more than conquerors, to tread on devils and snakes and scorpions. Listen to me. God is raising up the church. We are supposed to be storming the gates of hell, not waiting till they come to us. We are creating. Created the same power that raised up Christ Jesus from the dead. He is on the inside of us, but you've got to activate that power. Mary, Queen of Scots, said this, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than I fear the armies of the face of the earth. <laughs> I think we ought to get back to Ephesians 6, 10, and 18. Finally, brother and sister be strong in the Lord yeah yeah bishop whatever 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 whatever, whatever. no be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the tricks of the devil. Listen to me, church. We have lost our focus, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You're not wrestling against the White House. You're not wrestling against the president. You're not wrestling against the Democrats. You're not wrestling against the Republicans. We are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Everybody say, praying on. Always. And with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance. Oh, there's a word. Perseverance. There's a word. We've lost it. Well, God, I prayed three times and nothing happened. I went on a fast once 20 years ago for 20 minutes. <laughs> kind of like that lady that said, I, I, I tried to lose weight. I gave her bread for a day. perseverance and supplication for all saints. There is nothing more that Satan fears than when a church bows its knee to the king of glory in prayer and fasting. Because listen to me, when we do, God will release an anointing that will cause us to shake the very caverns of hell. I want you to ask yourself again, tomorrow morning when you get up, will it matter? And I ain't talking about to other people. When you get up tomorrow morning, will it matter to the devil? Uh-oh, she's up again. He's up again. And they, when his feet hit the floor, something happens. Here's the conclusion of the matter. We must have the supernatural power of God. We must have the supernatural power of God. Where we do have the axe head, Ecclesiastes 10, 10 is a lie. If the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. God said that's Eagle Heights. We still got the axe head, but it's dull. We must not only recover the axe, the axe head, we must sharpen it continually. That means that prayer and fasting must be normal to us. I told Pastor Lopez, God said to me, he, he said, listen, it's been too long. Prayer and fasting 
Since you've been the pastor of this church for 20 years, prayer and fasting has been the lifeblood and the lifeline of this church. And God said to me, he says, this time, when you get your foot on the devil's neck, you keep your foot on his neck. You keep applying pressure. We've got a mandate and a promise, but we have got to once again become a cathedral of fasting and prayer and praise and worship. Here's our mandate. Now, for this, I got to put on my spectacles. Here's why we're fasting and praying. Does anybody else love the word of God? God says when you fast and pray, Isaiah 58, beginning at verse 9, at that time when you call the Lord, we'll answer. Ooh, glory. Me and about four people are excited. <laughs> when you cry out, he will say, here I am. Listen now. If you get rid of the yoke from those around you. Some of y'all got some yokes you need to get rid of. And that ain't no joke. The finger pointing and malicious speaking. And if you offer yourself to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted one, then your light will shine in the darkness and your might will be like the, the night will be like the noonday. The Lord will always lead you. Always. Everybody say always. always. And satisfy you in a parched land and strengthen your bones. You will be like a watered garden and like a spring whose waters never run dry. Now watch this. Number two. The proof is in the pursuit. Don't tell me you want the anointing, but you don't want to pay the price. Bishop, I want to run the marathon. But you ain't even stepped on a treadmill. Forget about running. <laughs> Tell somebody the proof is in the pursuit. When we begin to pursue him, watch what he says, verse 12. Some of you, notice what it says, some of you. Because I'm preaching to somebody, but I know I'm not preaching to everybody. Because some of y'all, he... You're not, you're not hearing the Holy Ghost. But touch your neighbor and say, I know he ain't talking about you. Some of you. I like that. Some of you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will restore the foundations laid long ago. You will be the repairer of the breach, meaning broken walls. I like this one, the restorer of streets for people to dwell in, to live. If you keep from desecrating the Sabbath, from doing whatever you want on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath, A delight. <laughs> Woo. And you wonder why I get so excited during the praise and worship. I'm just so glad to be here. I can't hardly stand myself. I'm so glad to be with the people of God and to get to dance and shout and praise his name. I can't believe that God lets us do this. If you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable. If you honor it, not giving and going your own ways. Seeking your own pleasure. Here's one. And talking too much. Mm. At least about the wrong stuff. Then you will delight yourself in the Lord. Woo, and then God says, are you ready for the ride? I will make you ride over the heights of the land and let you enjoy the heritage of your father Jacob. <laughs> 
For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. How many of you would agree today that God is not a man? And unless he's not a man, he cannot lie. If he said that he will do it, he will do it. Are you ready for the ride? Are you ready for the anointing to break forth like it's never broken forth before? If you're ready and you know it, I want you to stand up and throw up your hands and begin to give him praise and to magnify his name. For he is on the way. He is worthy. Listen, church, one more time. It is time for the church of Jesus Christ to quit rearranging our theology to fit our situation and start making our situation bow to the theology once given to our forefathers and that is this that he's the same God with the same story glory to glory we will praise his name I'm trying to tell you that in 2019 he still heals he still delivers he still does miracles he still moves Moves in a mighty way. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and turn from wicked ways and seek my face, then I shall hear from heaven. Oh, don't you give him a patty cake, patty cake. Put your hands together and say, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. Glory to God.